Hi, everybody. My name is Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. You know, really, I mean, so much of our lives are involved in, in things, in, in the busyness of the day, in the business of our lives, in the, in the, in the day-to-day activities. And yet we know there's something overlighting, overshadowing the day, over just overlighting us, over over a, a sense of, of the glory of, of being in a human body, a sense of the glory of being on this extraordinary planet Earth. And we know somehow again and again and again and again that an experience is available to us as human beings that cuts through, that cuts around, that brings us home, that brings us into the home of love. That somehow all of us, whether it's buried deep, whether it's right on the surface, whether we've studied spiritual, metaphysical things for year after year after year, something in us in the dead of night, when we're sick, when someone is ill, when, when our prayer comes into our heart, we know that there is a place of love. And that place of love is what throughout history people have called God, people have called truth, people have called the way, the Tao. And throughout history, that has been the call. That has been the call of all the teachers and all the, the mystics throughout history is let's go home. Let's as a human species go home. In this human body now, we can have the experience of that love, of that oneness. And now, and as part of so much of history, it seems like it's, it's chaotic. It seems like for all of us, between this and that, and oil and the economy, and, and family issues, and, and health, and, and money, that there's a tremendous amount of chaos. And how do we get through? How do we get into every day and into the love? And we try it through family, we try it through religion, we try, we try to find the heart. We try to find the way home. And we know there's a way. And really the way is through that open heart. Now how do we get to the open heart? How do we find that love? Because we know it exists. And that is you know, the call from all the teachers and masters throughout history is that there is a way and that there is a way for us to recognize the truth. That, that in fact, we are all brothers and sisters in here on this planet, that we are one with the whales and the dolphins, that there is a, a singular energy, a central force in this universe that people have called God, people have called a lot of things. But that is what every human being is made of. And when a human being experiences that to any extent, it feels like love. And that oneness, that connection is so strong that when a human being has that consistently, then that truth is revealed. Then that person could say, honestly, the Father and I are one. Truth and I are one, God and I are one. And what does that mean? Is that the experience, the momentum of that in, in a life is real. That to know that love and to know that oneness more and more and more consistently brings you into that truth. And again, that's what the bridging show is about, to, to, to sh have people share with you their quest, their journey their extraordinary lives where that has been such an extraordinary and central focus. We have with us Stu Byrne, who's an extraordinary, I mean, he's extraordinary as a being. I mean, he's 92 years old. He's been on this planet 92 years. He drove an hour and a half by himself to come here. Extraordinarily energetic, powerfully gifted. He's an author of an extraordinary new book called Truth Shock. A millennium challenge and literally his whole life has been dedicated to 
to the melding, the understanding of, of science and metaphysics. I mean, he studied with Maharishi, he studied with uh, Paramahansa and Yogananda. He was somewhere along the line, he became a second degree uh, Lama Yoga, Yogi. And this new book is like a call, a call to awaken. And like he was saying earlier, we were talking before the show started, he was talking about like that's what bridging heaven and earth is about, is that we need to awaken to go home, awaken into that love. And he talks about these shocks, these misunderstandings we have as human beings that prevent us from coming into that love. And we're honored that he's taken the time and energy to come and be with us and share with us. And then, as we normally do, we have two extraordinary videos that, again, are done in that, in that vibration, the vibration of collaboration, the vibration of love, the vibration of oneness. We have one from Jen DeLeaf, uh, a beautiful Tree of Life video. You know, we've shown one of her videos before, and she, we've gotten tremendous response from that. And then later on in the season, you know, probably a dozen or so shows, we're going to have, uh, and she's been on before, Cecilia, this extraordinary singer from Norway, and we have some video of her. So again, it's an opportunity. And then if, if people have been watching the show recently, you know we're in the middle of an international uh, art project where all these extraordinary artists from all over the world are doing new original pieces based on the thing Bridging Heaven and Earth. So we have two of those. Uh, we're showing one from Jen, who did that video, and one from Erin Allen. Uh, and each one of those was done in that sense, that quest, that desire to come more into that oneness, that love. So again, it's an opportunity. So join me in a short meditation, then we'll have the first video, and then we'll have Stu with us. And it's again, it's time for us to come together and go home. Okay, thank you. So the first video tonight is going to be Tree of Life with, by Jen DeLeaf. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful piece. Again, you people have requested that we show another one of her videos, and we got it, and we're on it to show it, and then Stu will be with it. So enjoy. And the birds and the trees. 
trees. Trees merge. Trees do not fight trees. You can cut my bark. I'll not fight back. You can chop me down. My trunk will weep tears of gum. And my tall length will lie like a shame. But I say nothing. Just letting my being or not being speak. I make no decisions. When I have a life, I grow as I can. Then I die. What am I? Simply a tree. Just letting my being Hi everybody, welcome back. So we're on the set with Stu, but before that I wanted to tell you that this picture here was uh, Jen DeLeaf did for the art project, uh, the, the Bridging International Art Project, and that's her conception of uh, bridging heaven and earth, and it's called Drakhed Bithad, Bridging Heaven and Earth. So you'll see uh, in the next section you'll also see another piece that just, they've just come in from all over the world, it's really extraordinary. So welcome Stu, it's great to have you. Thank you, it's good to be here. And uh, I'm rather speechless about the vibes that are here, but uh, I think... In what way? I'm afraid to ask the uh -huh. first question. Are the vibes good? Oh, very good. Yeah. And uh, I think that I should explain uh, very quickly that uh, I do not pretend to be any special guru or come with magic robes. I'm just uh, from long ago one of the outsiders who became very curious about what's going on on the inside. So I spent about 30 or 40 years on the inside to come out to the outside and explain what it, what was going on on the inside, you might say. When you uh, talk about the inside, do you mean like internal? To study the know, internal in world? The, uh, in the mystical world, in the uh, uh, the world of metaphysical uh, discussion and uh, uh, so what happens is uh, there was a problem that uh, when people and groups uh, get together in some religious group or philosophical group metaphysical group and they all come together one thing is happening that is strange 
They're, they're like white sheep. They're all talking to each other. And what about the black sheep on the other side of the fence? What about uh, the scientists, the brilliant uh, scientific brains we have, who are partially atheistic or non-dualistic and so forth, and they look at this other inside and say, not unless it's susceptible of verification. That's their phrase. Okay. So, it so turns out that uh, uh, the reason for the title of Truth Shock is that uh, we have crossed the millennium threshold uh, coming into the 2000 and on up uh, that uh, is a shock in itself for the reason that it seems that we have pulled a great cargo of conceptions and misconceptions across the millennial threshold without cleaning out the attic. And so it so happens that uh, some events have occurred that change many things and bring us into a kind of a crisis where the milk of parables that we've received before now must be the meat of knowing. And uh, instead of that being theory, I belong to no society, no religion, nothing. All I'm doing is reporting um, what has been a revelation or two revelations of the last century and a half that uh, we're in in general in humanity are we're as unaware of that revelation as the Romans were of a wandering carpenter and carpenter in Galilee, and yet it's all out in books and volumes and translations. It goes like this: Here's the truth, Jack. That uh, if you think of uh, the various. Uh, levels of uh, nature, such as the, uh, the kingdom, the mineral kingdom, the, the uh, vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom, the human kingdom, and the fifth kingdom. Now that may sound an abstraction, but what happens is that it comes down to some actual uh, nuts and bolts reality that uh, we can reach. And uh, so, uh, the test of this is now to come out to empirical science and meet them in their own turf, since they say it must be susceptible of verification, and bring the wisdom knowledge and these new revelation knowledges to their attention and compare uh, exoteric cosmologies with esoteric cosmologies with the wisdom knowledge universe and the astrophysicist universe. And lo and behold, uh, modern science, its paradigms are leaning toward the esoteric in such a way that this reconciliation is occurring. And if there is a reconciliation, what it means is that uh, science, which generally holds the keys to our our systems of evaluation can now look at this wisdom knowledge which, which preceded uh, religions or science from the foundations of the world, that this given knowledge is not an abstraction, it's real. And uh, for example, uh, in some of the abstractions that we love, such as uh, uh, Christ's uh, remark that uh, straight is the gate and few there are who find, find it. Now you don't need to have that as an abstraction. You can, the gate is here within ourselves. And that is another main point of this. Uh, so wait, what would book. you say the revelations are? That, like what specific revelations are starting to, where science is starting to verify? Well, they were uh, two. Uh, see, Jesus is called the messianic uh, uh, messenger because he uh, 
came at the time of the turn of the ages uh, and the beginning of the Piscean Age. Now at the end of that age and at the doorways to the Aquarian Age, uh, are we aware of any new messianic messengers? Yes, they've occurred. Two, one in 1875 and uh, later in the 20s uh, between the two wars. Uh, in the form of actual letters, some precipitating right out of the air, now published in uh, the Mahatma letters, uh, and 27 years of telepathed information to uh, Alice Bailey, absolute volumes, and these are from the Master. Now, Fifth Kingdom has to be explained a little bit, but uh, you have to get into your uh, reincarnation cycle and realize that this is a, a learning cycle like going through high school and college, graduate school. The graduates are the fifth kingdom, the ones that do not have to return. These are the masters, what we used to call archangels and so forth. Uh, and the and so days. what have they realized? What, okay. When you get to the fifth kingdom, what is the realization you have? Oh, there's no, no harps passed out. Nobody uh, blesses the canons of one nation and another. Uh, no set of wings, nothing but practical assignments of tasks. And some of them choose, as the compassionate ones, to reincarnate again, to walk among us. And uh, of course, the uh, Dalai Lama is a good example. But uh, who, incidentally, for those who the, the hard-headed uh, uh, scientists who don't believe in these things are invited to stop walking off into the sunset when the evidence is right before them that uh, before he dies he places a known article away in a hidden place and when he is a child and rediscovered he goes and finds it again. How much more do they want rubbed into them? But there are many more proofs. But anyway, these revelations you're talking about are speaking the masters, the risen ones, Christ, uh, Jesus. Nobody asks about the soul of Jesus. The risen master before he was born. The, these masters speak and are published in many translations. And they say that the uh, Christ has accelerated his intention of return, but that humanity must respond by raising its own level of consciousness to meet him. And instead of this being an abstraction, uh, you bring me to one point that perhaps I can cover in this short thing. That is a very important subject of thought forms. And this is all in relation to what these revelations have been. Now, the thought forms, uh, when you, uh, that actually been seen by psychics and you can see illustrations of them. Evil and angry, uh, hateful thought forms are dark, and, and uh, they are boomerangs, and they come back to the one who, and also if they are positive thought forms, and loving thought forms, they also boomerang to the benefit. But this, instead of being an abstraction, again comes into susceptible of verification. The, uh, Water crystals have been photographed. Uh, you know, they like snowflakes, they have the different patterns. So in the ener energies that are around us, these crystals form according to, and there's been shown a difference in the pattern of the crystallization under conditions of hatred and prayer. And uh, the uh, Maharishi University people have proved this by having uh, targeted cities. Uh, under the meditational control for several years, they've actually brought down the, the crime rates uh, with the, their positive uh, emanations. But the important thing, the, the crucial thing in the whole cover and true shock title is our own contribution to uh, that great sea of consciousness surrounding the planet. And so therefore, whereas uh, According to the media, we are in a very black and terrible time. Uh, just look beyond the media to uh, what's not on the media. And there is a whole world of people, of uh, light workers, 
uh, like many of you, uh, who uh, emanate positive uh, thought forms, and uh, this has been uh, increasing the power of that ocean of thought. And I believe uh, I had one chart. Well, we can refer to it later. But there's one picture in the book, and it's here somewhere, that shows that in the last century we have expanded our group consciousness into the United Nations, the European Union, and all these expanding concepts of humanity has come up out of the darkness. So, I mean, in your life, because you've lived almost a century now, God bless you, but <laughs> I mean, have you noticed, like, in your day-to-day -day life or in the life of, you know, the species, the life of, you, you know, humankind, that there has been that change? Can you feel it? I mean, can you feel it as a spiritual being that that energy is? Alan, I only feel it when I'm among the groups who are projecting it, like up on Meditation Mount where you hold hands and you send it into the sky. And you've been in groups like that. The builders of the Adidas, one time we, were, the whole audience was sending themselves out into orbit. We could actually feel that we're in orbit around the planet sending this part and it is possible and every day I've talked to the the head of groups who have just come from conferences like back east in New York where 60 representative world groups are in the daily every day sending this great invocations out and this positive uh, thought form. and you say that's more than it was 20 years ago 40 years ago it's uh, guided by more Knowledge, you see, the, the the faith, the good faith part of regular people who find their faith, that's one positive thing. But it hasn't got the high voltage, the high wattage, of those who are informed and know the technique and the reason why and what they are sending this to. And so those. Would who you are, say there are more of those people and more of that energy around than ever before yes, now? Too? Yes. Uh, it is growing. But the thing is that we are in your, what you might call the battle of Armageddon in the forces of light and darkness. And this is part of the revelations. It's not me. Not me, not a religion. Uh, in fact, what happens here is that, uh, uh, like the phrase in Exodus where Moses was looking at the burning bush and he was instructed, remove thy shoes from off thy feet for thou art on hallowed ground. Well now, this sort of learning is a sort of a temple where you take off your shoes and you exchange them for some slippers. I, I've done this, this is my metaphor. The, the shoes we call faith and belief. And the new slippers are called seeing and knowing. We've crossed this threshold where we're starting to get down to nuts and bolts instead of abstractions. Do you think the knowing would have to be verifiable? I mean, you know, you could experience something so deeply that you know it to be true. Yes. And yet there's the scientific evidence hasn't reached it yet. I mean, well, now, the whole trick is and the game is that if science can verify certain things of the wisdom knowledge, then they're going to start paying attention to more and more of it. Do so you uh, think it's just a shift? I mean, people who knew, knew. No, no, actual discoveries, actual things. Uh, for instance, that's, uh, the astrophysicists have said, hey, we can only see about 8 or 10% of the known universe, but we, we measure its mass much larger, so we call that dark matter. Well, the wisdom knowledge says, Matter is in layers of finer matter down to denser matter in these uh, layers. And lo and behold, along come the quantum physicists who say, well, you know, gravitation isn't limited to our own plane. We see about 10 other dimensions. They're beginning to make these connections and sit up and take notice. And uh, so uh, 
there, this is a, a time of messianic increase. Now, well, let's, why don't we do this? Why don't we hold that thought and we're going to show the second video now and then when we come back we'll get into this messianic thought, okay? Okay. So the second video we're going to show tonight is the Cecilia, this incredible Norwegian singer. She's just an incredible beauty. She and her husband Arnie are coming in all the way from Norway to do a show with us later on in the year. It's going to be spectacular. She's been on before. So it's Ave Maria with Cecilia. Just enjoy it. Hi, welcome back. So we're back with Stu. And also I want to tell you that the picture in between us now, the change picture, is Nature's Heart with another one. Uh, Aaron Allen did this one for the International Bridging Art Project. You know, you'll see as you see the shows coming up, I mean, there's just one extraordinary picture after another coming in from all over the world. We probably have over a hundred now and we have art openings all over and it's just really energetically uh, acupuncture for the planet. So Stu, you wanted to shock everybody? 
Go ahead. Did I? That's what you told me at the break. Well, the shock is that we're trying to resolve the universe in a couple of minutes here, so... 20. Uh, for 20. So yeah, I'll so make it we're done. good. I'll go where the shock is. Um, uh, I told you about revelations and so forth, and we're getting to the place where we get rid of the abstractions and we get down to nuts and bolts, uh, hard reality facts that even science can get into. So, uh, one thing of the old concepts we used to have was that uh, communication from uh, the other world to mankind was done in biblical times, the angels talking to people. We think it was back then, no, that's wrong. It happens every day, it keeps on happening. And to show you what I mean is, uh, but we, because of language, the words have changed not archangels and so forth, now called adepts and masters, but the same level of the fifth kingdom. Now, to race forward and give you substance uh, as an example of where this nuts and bolts is. Communication today. Uh, some years ago when I was working on a total, total world concordance of all the, the uh, metaphysical schools and philosophies. I was working on the nature of the universe at the time, and a strange thought came into my head. We talk about communications now. The thought phrase was, matter is attenuating, matter getting thinner. I thought, where'd that come from? I looked around, what happened? I thought, well, that might explain radioactivity or something. I, I put it out of my mind and went on. So about three months later, I was invited to a very special soiree of uh, esotericists who were hosting a famous lady from India who was very famous for uh, channelizing, channeling high, very high entities. And uh, when, when the lady became still, I noticed her face slightly swelled, and then she began to speak. She spoke with the voice of a man. She said, my name is Moria. Well, we knew right away that here was one of the archangels, the demigods, the masters that had been in the fifth kingdom for centuries and who had written many of the books published in the Mahatma letters. So Moria went on for a couple of hours and spoke to us of science and many things. Uh, he gave us a mandate, uh, I'll just give you part of it, a couple sentences of it. When he said, um, set down stepping stones in the confusion of men's hearts and show them the foolishnesses and the cruelties that they commit, to which he added later, when you speak the word that will awaken a man who sleeps low, our voices speak with you also. Well, anyway, what happened? He uh, went on talking about science and said we should watch the doors of science opening which will enable man to understand his own nature. And this was two decades before we did the human genome and the DNA area. And uh, right in the middle of all of this, and what I'm getting to, is that he tossed me a signal that he knew only I would get. He raised his voice and he said, matter is attenuating. We have told you this before, but we will repeat it. Well, when I went into this attenuation, it went way back, I'm through with the, that communication, but what it comes to, went way back to 8,000 or more years ago among the Brahmins and other great Wait, ones. so wait, did you like look into this, what that meant? This is the looking in. Right, so I'm you doing. studied this. You yeah. looked into it. Okay, well, yeah. I, I've been in science half my life. I was 18 years with uh, Lytton Industries as an uh, engineering writer doing all those books for the troops on all your weapon systems. So I got into science. But anyway, I went back to uh, what the Brahmins and ancient ones were saying when they spoke of the universe as the breathing in and out of Brahma or breathing in and out of God. And you get this attenuation, this heart of the cosmos thing. And so we're not going to show the charts, but in the book is a chart that shows uh, the results of this. Uh, you see, we have three 
Now we've crossed the line and we're getting into all this hard reality. We have three creation stories. The old one that we're all familiar with of the seven days of creation. The uh, physicists, the astrophysicists didn't like that uh, one, so they gave us another one, which I feel is more miraculous, in that uh, a tiny atom, suddenly not the world was created, but in half a second, the entire cosmos was created. I feel that's a very nice... Is that the Big Bang theory? That's the Big Bang. Yeah. And um, the astrophysicists are very... What's the third one? I'm coming to that. Oh, okay. The, I don't want to rush it. No, we, no I, we got plenty of time no, to sell it. No, no, yeah. just I'll okay. Out. No. There's a, okay. There's a hook. I have All right, I, I'm, I'm messing with your hook. I'm sorry. So, um, they uh, don't explain where the met macho atom came from in the first place. But anyway, they're very sincere they, and great and intellectual. These scientists, very brilliant, and <clears throat> they follow what they observe. And the mathematics tell them something, but they may be uh, observing it wrong. And they themselves confess that there is still a missing factor that might change things. Boom! More you gave it to me. Matter is attenuating. If matter is a ch change expanding universe, the word expanding to attenuating. And you have a density oscillating universe. Uh, but many succession of universes, uh, and you have a sine wave of the breathing in and out, you know. So the, the consequence is, and this is technical, I'm sorry, that if there is this density change, it changes the refraction index of light. And this will knock hell out of Hubble's uh, redshift theory supporting the expanding universe. This gets into the technicalities, but uh, if you tie it all together, we are in a, a truth shock period of uh, reconciliation. Now, I, I want to give Did you... we do the third one yet? Because if we did, you went right past me. Oh, well, this is the third, third theory. The third one was that uh, oh, it's, oscillating, it's attenuating the oscillating the universe. In out. The oscillating okay. universe. All right. I... Well, my part, and I, with all due respect to my uh, scientific skills. Quick, I'll so. make two more points then. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, the reason I bring in the wonderful wisdom of the ancients, like the Brahmins, is they could read this knowledge. And uh, our textbooks up to about 1950 used to say that the consensus of scientific opinion was that the age of the solar system was a little over two billion years. And then we went back, went to the moon, we brought back moon rocks, and we did the aging, and we came up to the same figure that the Brahmins 8,000 years ago said, 4.3 billion years. They went around saying, hey, you know, we pushed the geological clock back to 4.3 billion years. The Brahmins had said it a long time ago. So there was an ability to read these things. Um, the thing I want to get to, though, is this, that the average knowledge of humanity, mankind, of the nature and purpose of man and the universe is as deep as the proverbial pit, and we are in a great age of darkness in relation to these things. So the uh, Irony is that we should expend our genius in reaching for the stars when the greatest and most unexplored horizon lies closest at hand within ourselves. We have to know our own nature, and uh, we are the aliens, you know, the, uh, the souls who come into the body and take in the body as a host, therefore we are the aliens. See, but, what you're saying is that the real frontier, the real place of, of exploration in a human being would be at least as much internal as external. Oh, yes. Oh, if I could get into the, the psychic gremlin of your gut, of your astral, and all your chemistries and your genetics and everything that that builds up the defense mechanisms and the hate and everything else, and I want this, and kill him, and all. 
if you could cut off that false passage to the brain that gives the, and open up that door to your higher self and regard this, here's a, an end message you might say, regard our bodies as a vehicle for that higher self and a vehicle is like a horse. Where is the rider? And you see, when you get in touch with your higher self, this is the rider that takes hold of the horse and says, quit horsing around, takes him back into the stable. Uh, that is the lesson that we gain through all the cycle of lives of learning, of conquering this psychic. So in other words, the momentum of your life would change from being ego and separation driven to love and oneness driven. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Uh, and the meditation thing, of, I didn't even, we can't even get into that, but... That we can, but a short version. <laughs> falling back into your higher self. There's a diagram in the book of this gate, uh, in the lower self, the, the mortal self, what St. Paul called the corruptible body. He didn't mean sinful, he meant biodegradable. We go to dust from the, our bodies. But then there's the incorruptible or the eternal self. So there's a gate between it, there's a chart in there, show you what it is, and it is when we align ourselves with our higher self and flow. There's an upward flow, there's a spiraling flow of energy that we can flow up as well as we can bring down the chi or the prana. The Would prana you say it almost the... looks in a sense like a valve and to open that valve? Well, that's metaphorical or allegorical picture of the valve, but uh, All right. it opens. And it's just like Jesus said, uh, straight as a gate and the few there are who find. Well, it it's really means opening your lower nature to the higher. Then there's a gate of uh, the higher self speaking to the brain. Unfortunately, the behaviorists uh, believe that the brain is the sole receptacle of all that we know, and they don't believe even that the mind is separate. And uh, uh, the proof of mind and, separate, and soul separation is in your, hip, your regression under hypnosis to past lives. Many of those lives in different centuries and countries cannot possibly have a genetic connection. So something other than the brain had to do the remembering. There are proofs. Let there be, let it be susceptible to verification. It's happening. But would you say like once that, that valve opens or once that experience happens of that knowing, of that oneness, then the verification becomes almost secondary? The, the writer comes. You can stand aside as the observer. So you know it. You know it to be true. Yeah, you can you can demonstrate it to yourself. You can, uh, uh, oh, the struggle with this inner psyche is, is terrible. It'll fight its, for its turf, even to the point of suicide sometimes. But when you clearly know the difference, and you, you can do it, you can stand aside as the observer. And no. I mean, that's what theoretically all the techniques of all the teachers you know, of the meditations, of the satsangs, of the, the talks, of being with, around the energy of the teacher. It's all to, to open those valves, to, to get that flow going from the lower self to the higher self. Right. And there I can make a closing note. I don't know. We've got another three hours. Oh, so. oh, oh. Uh, in many of these things, uh, I had little inspirations, and they came to me in the form of little quatrains. And uh, my wife used to say, where is that coming from? Because she felt they were magic. And uh, so one of these uh, that you might remind me of is this. The truth, my friend, is very much like wine. The taste of yours is different than mine. But make and vintage cannot change the fact that both are from the same eternal vine. And another one in relation, in relation to all this confusion of many words for God and Allah and 
Jehovah and uh, Brahman or whatever, <clears throat> uh, the inspiration came through like this. The sages knew the wisdom of our faith from Babylon and Ur to Samothrace. When speech was stilled and heart and soul were one, a thousand gods but wore a single face. And in closing, the hills of ages mark the paths we trod in futile search of why we sweat and plod. And now and then we reach a crest and see the course of time that changes Claude to God. Well, but the funny thing is you have time for more of those. Oh, so, <laughs> so the cl we should flip the closing. <laughs> oh a, my how God. How much time is it? We got four minutes of closings. Uh -huh. Close it again. Because <laughs> if I close it. Well, the main big message is man know thyself. We have to know uh, our nature. And uh, the thing is that uh, you've all seen these science fiction pictures where. Uh, some alien entity comes into the body and takes over, and it could be a baddie or a goodie. Right. Go ahead, talk. And uh, so, look what happens. This entity comes in and uses your body as a host. Well, then aren't we the aliens, we the souls, come into the body and use it as a host? And uh, so, what strange thing happens is that when that gate is rusted and not open. It's the bodies that do the wars and fighting. And the soul never never does the shooting. I mean, the, the, the reality is that with the gate closed, we think we're separate. When the oh, gate's open, then... Thank the, you, thank you. There's the one. Oh, well, when we say... Every once in a while. Or... <laughs> when we say you or he or I or you, to whom... The are bell we, toll all. No. <laughs> to whom are we referring? Right. To our physical body? Usually, people are. Notice all your young people and everything else, uh, not only they feel that the body is the only reality, and they fill it with uh, body studs and, and uh, tattoos, and uh, uh, it's a cult. The body. Huh? Where's the soul? Where's the... The you connection. notice how, how the, the gate is closed? The, the bubble gums and the jingle bells in the head? They walk with the Walkman uh, on their ear, frying the brains with all the rock, hard rock. And poor things, compassion. Uh, uh, you know, the, the masters that look at this uh, uh, are, are filled with a, a grief of compassion that this goes on. And uh, so there is a uh, battle of Armageddon between good and evil. And uh, the dark forces, you know, can grab you through this gut level. Whereas the forces of light work at the mental and spiritual level. And uh, that's the rule of the game. And so sometimes if you're not in control of this, you can be obsessed, as Hitler was, and some of his cronies, because when that obsession was withdrawn from them, they went nuts, either committed suicide or hey, the whole thing. And, and one, I don't know how many people know this, but you are very familiar with the German swastika coming from that wheel of life in India but the wheel of life, and each spoke the wheel of life, was turning in the clockwise direction of life. What would an antichrist do? He'd take it, turn it back. The swastika goes backwards. And uh, you know that's interesting because I mean that's really just a little turn. I mean it's you know the little mm -hmm. turn from you know darkness into light. And you know really we're coming to the end of the show, so I just really want to thank you for bringing so okay. much consciousness to us. And if you want any information about Stu, the book True Shock, uh, Al <coughs> Alan, 805-687-2053. Good night. We love you. God bless you. Thanks for coming. We love you.